Hello, baking friends, and welcome to the King Arthur Baking Company Kitchens. As we pause to reflect on this year, we couldn't think of a better way to share the joy of baking with you this holiday season than by gifting you a class filled with all the tips and tricks to creating this beautiful gingered apple cream pie. My name is Melanie and I'm a pastry instructor at our baking school. I'll be guiding you through making this the perfect pie for you. We'll talk about the secret to tender flaky pie crusts, how pre-cooking the apples gives this pie filling just the right consistency and texture. Then we'll spice things up with two types of ginger and top it with an elegant lattice finish. It's sure to be a delicious ending to your holiday meals. Let's get started by talking about our ingredients. So the first thing we're gonna do is start with our crust, and that is going to start with some all-purpose flour. Now when we're working with our flour, um, if you're using volume measuring cups instead of actually weighing your ingredients, if you dip right into your flour, you can get a very heavy cup of flour, um, and that can, Make baked goods that are dry, dense, heavy, crumbly, which are usually not words we want to use to describe our baked goods. On the same end, if we were sifting everything into our cup, we would have a very light cup of flour. Um, so if we're using a scale, we know we have exactly what we need in there. If you're doing the volume measure, you want to follow this method. So I'm going to fluff up my flour with a spoon or a scoop, because as your flour is sitting in your canister or in your bag in your pantry, it starts to compact a little bit. And so we wanna make sure that we fluff it up so it's nice and light. I'm gonna hold my cup over my container and then lightly sprinkle my flour into my cup. Once my cup is overflowing, I don't wanna tap down on my cup or shake it at all, but if, when it's overflowing, I'm gonna take a straight edge here and I'm just gonna swipe off any excess. So our procedure was fluff, sprinkle, and sweep. And that will give us about the amount that we need in one cup of flour, which is 120 grams or about four and a quarter ounces. So I have my flour in my bowl here. And we're gonna to start to add our other ingredients. So the first thing that we're going to add is some salt. So we wanna make sure that our pie pastry is flavorful um, and we're gonna be using some unsalted butter later on. So adding the salt now allows us to control the amount of salt going into our pastry. Um, one thing that I always like to say is there's a thousand pastry roads that lead to Rome. So there's a lot of different ways that you can make this pie yours um, and a lot of different ways to get to those same ends. So when we're talking about flavoring, um, you can decide how much salt you want in your recipe. So when I was younger, my mom used to use margarine to make our pie pastry, um, and then she also put the amount of salt in, so I tend to like a saltier pie pastry. If you wanna cut back on the amount of salt that's in there, you can totally do that. Um, just make sure you have some in there because we want it to be nice and flavorful and not bland. So I have my salt in there. Next, to make this nice and festive, we're gonna add some ground ginger. And you could really substitute any other spice for the ginger in this. If you wanted to do cinnamon, that would be great as well. Um, and it's just gonna kind of boost that nice ginger flavor in this pie. Next, I'm gonna add some granulated sugar. So that's going to give our pie crust some sweetness. It's also going to aid with browning. So when we think of sugar caramelizing it as it goes in the oven, that's what's gonna give us that really nice golden brown crust. So if we take a look in my bowl here, you'll see that I have all of my ingredients separated. And that way I can go back and double check that I have everything before I actually start mixing things together. So I have my flour in the center, and then I start everything else at 12 o'clock with my salt, ginger, and sugar. So now that I know I have all of my dry ingredients in there, I'm gonna to toss them together. And you could do this with a whisk. Um, I like to use a bowl scraper. The round end goes into the bowl. And I'm just gonna to toss those ingredients together just to combine them a little bit. And once we toss those together, we'll be ready to talk about our butter. So I have my nice cold butter here that I've cut into kind of half inch cubes. I'm using unsalted butter again today, but if you were using salted butter, totally fine also. And I'm just gonna separate the chunks of butter into my flour mixture. 
Once I have them separated, I'm gonna toss the butter with a little bit of the flour just to coat them so they don't instantly stick back together. So once I've coated my flour, we wanna start cutting in the butter. And there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Today I'm gonna to be using a pastry blender. Uh, you can use a fork, you could even put it in a food processor and just pulse the mixture uh, to break down those butter pieces. But the idea is when I'm using my pastry blender, I wanna cut straight down through the butter and then rock the pastry blender on the side of my bowl. So I'm cutting straight down through, so I'm actually lifting up each time and cutting through to make those butter pieces smaller. And a couple things are happening as we're doing this cutting in method with this cold butter. So the first obvious one is that our butter pieces are getting smaller. As you're doing this, if your butter gets stuck on your pastry blender, you can just kind of swipe it off with your thumb. You can even do this by hand. Um, we wanna keep our butter nice and cold. We wanna have kind of visible butter throughout this entire process. So if I'm doing it by hand, I want it to be a really quick motion that I pick up the, the butter pieces and kind of squish them between my fingers and then instantly drop them again. So it's a really quick motion that I'm not holding on to the butter for a long time, um, but you're just kind of squishing it into the flour so that we start to get what looks like a coarse meal. I'm gonna switch back to my pastry blender here. So we talked about our butter pieces getting smaller, but the most important thing that's happening here uh, is we're starting to tenderize our pastry. And so when I think of pie pastry, I usually think of two camps. There's kind of the tender camp. If you can think of uh, shortbread, how it's really nice and melt in your mouth, a little bit crumbly. If you're using fats like shortening or lard or coconut oil, you tend to get those really tender melt in your mouth crusts when you have fats that are kind of 100% fat. When we start to talk about flakiness, we're talking about layers. So if we think of croissants or puff pastry that have those really nice defined layers. Um, and depending on the type of fat that you're using and how you're working it into your flour, you can kind of get the best of both worlds, that you can have something that's tender but that's also flaky. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. So as I start to cut in my butter, what's happening is that we're starting to coat some of those flour granules, or let's say most of those flour granules, with fat. And that will make kind of a nice barrier that eventually when we add water to this mixture, um, when wheat flour and water come together, they usually create gluten, which is this elastic network that holds our baked goods together. In its absence, things would kind of fall apart, and so we want to make sure that we have some gluten formation there. But as we cut in our butter finer and finer, that's going to coat most of our flour so that when we do add our water, we're kind of limiting the amount of, of water that that flour can absorb thereby limiting the amount of gluten that it's going to form. So it's going to keep it more tender instead of chewy, because I don't think anyone wants a chewy pie crust. So I'm gonna keep cutting this in. And as I'm doing this, I'm making sure to get the flour on the side so that most of it is getting coated. So at this point, our mixture shouldn't look like really dry, powdery flour anymore. It should start to have kind of a coarser texture where it's starting to look like breadcrumbs, um, even kind of the canned Parmesan cheese that kind of has that look to it. And the more we cut the butter in, the more tender our pastry will be. So if you like that really tender melt in your mouth crust, you want to continue cutting in your butter until the mixture looks like breadcrumbs. If you like a flakier crust, when we talk about kind of those flaky layers, um, butter is going to give that to us. When we think of what butter is made of, it is essentially about 80% fat and 20% water. And so when we put that in the oven, the fat will melt into the surrounding dough, get absorbed and it will become nice and tender. But when we have water and it heats up, it creates steam and expands. And so wherever we have these little pieces of butter within our dough, that steam will expand and we'll have that nice illusion of flaky layers. <laughs> 
So depending on how tender or flaky you like things, the finer you cut your butter in, the more tender, kind of melt in your mouth it will be. If you like things flakier, you'll leave your butter pieces a little bit larger. You'll just wanna make sure um, that as you're doing that, you at least cut some in a little finer so that you do have some tenderness. Because if we leave the butter pieces really large, we're not cutting a lot, we're not coating a lot of the flour, um, and that can lead to kind of a chewier pastry. So you're, um, the idea is if you're cutting in finer, we'll have less available flour to take on water. So we'll be bringing our dough together with less water. If you leave larger pieces of butter that will give you a flakier pie crust, um, you'll have more available flour to take on water and you'll probably need to add a little more water. So that's why when we get to the water portion, there's usually um, a couple different measurements um, that you can add water and it really depends how much you're cutting in your fat in your pastry. So this is looking good. When it starts to kind of clump on my pastry blender, that's when I know I'm getting close. And if we take a look at our mixture here, it has that nice kind of coarse breadcrumb look to it. So I don't have really powdery flour around the outside. I do have some little visible butter pieces. So if I kind of take some of those out, you can see they're almost current size, but everything else is cut in very finely. So now we're ready to add our water. And I'm using nice cold water. If we have cold butter or cold fat going into our pastry, we wanna make sure we're using cold water. Um, some people like to use ice water, could be cold water just from the tap. If I do have ice in my water, I usually like to strain it out first so that I don't get any little bits of ice that are melting in my pastry afterwards. Um, and if you're used to making pie pastry, you might know uh, that we're usually adding a tablespoon at a time. And the great thing about this recipe is that we can actually add our water all at once. So I know because I've cut my butter in nice and finely, I know that my pastry is going to take at least this much water to bring it together. And then if I need to spot treat it a little later on, that's when I can add a little bit more. As we start mixing this, you can use a spatula or a spoon. I'm again gonna use that bowl scraper, kind of an extension of my hand. And the motion that I'm gonna use is kind of an up and folding over. So I'm gonna come down the side of my bowl and then come into the center and press down. And I'm gonna continue doing that around my bowl. And I actually want to use kind of the compression of folding this dough over itself and pressing down to get the dough to start holding together. When we go back to think about kind of that layering, as I'm folding, I'm layering those layers of dough on top of each other. That's gonna make it seem nice and flaky also. If it starts to stick on your tools, you can just kind of use another tool to scrape it off. That initial water as we get in is just a little bit sticky, but as it starts to get absorbed, shouldn't stick too much more. So I'm coming all the way underneath, bringing the dough over itself and really pressing down. So I think sometimes there's a kind of a myth that we have to be really delicate with pastry and that's true for some things, but as we're talking about pie pastry, particularly when we've cut our butter in really, really finely so that we have um, most of that flour coated with fat, that's already cutting down on kind of the amount of gluten that's being formed. So with less water, we have a little more leeway manipulation-wise, kind of working our dough um, to get it together without actually making it tough. So if I would bring my dough together with more water, I would wanna make sure that I'm not mixing it very much. If I'm bringing my dough together with less water, I'm gonna need to mix it a little bit more um, to bring it together. But because we have less water in there, it will keep it from getting tough. All right, so when I look at my mixture now, I have kind of a good amount of pastry that's holding together. It's really, you know, kind of a sh what we call a shaggy dough, so it's not really cohesive, but I have pieces that are holding together. So I'm just gonna set that down on my bench and kind of assess what I have left in my bowl here. As I'm working with this, if I pick it up and give it a really good squeeze, and open up and it stays together without falling apart and looking really floury, I have enough moisture in there so I don't need to add more water. So I'm gonna kind of add that to my piece out here. 
Same thing, grabbing a nice big handful, giving it a squeeze. And this one's kind of just on the border. You can see that it's just starting to crack a little bit, but I think as it gets worked in, it'll be fine. I have just a little bit here left in the base of my bowl that's a little dry and crumbly. And that's the part if I'm gonna add a little extra water, that's where I'll add it. So I'm just gonna grab a little bit of extra water here, probably just about a quarter to a half of a teaspoon. And we'll just toss that together, just like we did before. And I'm gonna add that now right on top of the rest of my mixture. Now you're probably looking at my dough right now thinking, that is way too dry. You definitely need more water in there to hold that together. But this is where we're gonna use that manipulation, kind of that folding to help bring this together because we've cut that butter in finely, it's really nice and tender. We've used less water to bring it together, so we have a little more leeway that we can work the dough without developing a lot of that gluten. As we start working with it, I'm going to come underneath here. You can use a spatula or even just your hands to do this. I'm using a bench knife today. Um, you could even do this on parchment paper um, and just kind of fold it over itself. But I'm gonna come all the way underneath the dough. I'm gonna fold it in half over itself and then press down really firmly. And that's gonna help again to kind of create those layers. Um, that folding method is a much easier kind of mixing method on the dough than if we were stirring it in our bowl. And I'm gonna do the same thing this way. So I kind of go from all four sides, going up and over and up and over. And you'll see now that my dough is starting to hold together a little bit better. Yes, I still have some stragglers here, but as I continue to knead this, that will help bring those drier pieces together. So I fold it kind of all four sides in, and now I'm gonna do a little bit of kneading by hand. So I'm gonna take my dough using that same up and over motion. So I'm gonna fold it directly in half over itself. And if I kind of turn this around, you can see it almost looks like a taco here. So I have that folded in half toward me. And then I'm going to use the kind of the base palm of my hand to press and roll this dough away such that that line that I had from my taco is now in the center of my dough. And I can grab any of these little stragglers that are there. I'm gonna give it a quarter turn and then continue doing that until all of my dry stragglers kind of work into my dough. So it'll take a few needs to do that. So I'm folding in half over itself. I'm pressing down and kind of rolling it away and then giving it a quarter turn. As you're doing this, we want those little stragglers and the dry pieces to work in, but if at any time it starts to feel sticky, um, like it's sticking to the bench, it's sticking to you, that's your cue to stop and move on to the next, the next stage. So I'm gonna do just a few more kneads here. So folding over, rocking away, giving it a turn. Folding over, rocking away, giving it a turn. And I'm gonna do about one more because I can feel that it's just starting to get a little tacky on the outside. So it's not sticky, but I can actually uh, feel that it's kind of like the back of a post-it note. So I'm gonna grab all of these other little pieces here. Just kind of set that right on top. Now, because we're gonna be making a two crust pie with the lattice on top, we needed to divide this in half. So some bakers like to divide 60-40, so you have a larger piece on the bottom. Um, I tend to just go in half. This is a generous amount of dough, so it's gonna make a, a nine inch pie for us. And even if you had deep dish, you would still have a little bit of dough left over. Um, so I just go right in half. It just makes it a little easier than trying to guess how much I need. So I'm gonna cut this directly in half. And as we look at this now, and I turn this open, you can see all of those nice layers in there already. So you can see the little pieces of butter um, that as they melt will make that nice flakiness and kind of all of the layering in there. 
And my dough is holding together, so it's cohesive. Yes, it still looks like there's some cracks in there, but it's not dry and falling apart. Um, and if you feel the center of your dough that you've cut, you'll see that it feels very moist. And that's what we're looking for. So it has that nice kind of tacky like the back of a post-it note, not necessarily sticky, and the outside is a little dry. Okay, but it is holding together. If yours is kind of falling apart, we want to make sure that we're working enough as we're kneading that it holds together and is completely cohesive. So I'm going to flatten these into some rounds because we are going to be rolling this into a round for our pie. And so I want to make sure I'm starting with the shape that I'm going to be rolling. So if I was rolling out a square, I would put these in a square shape. But because we're doing the rounds, we're going to keep them nice and round. And we're going to put them in just a little bit of plastic wrap. You want to cover them so that they don't dry out. So I'm going to place my dough right in the center of my plastic wrap and then wrap the dough up really nice and tight all the way around it. Once I have it wrapped up tight, I'm going to press down on my dough. And that is going to help fill in any little cracks around the edge. And as it's resting, it's an, a flatter surface. So I have about an inch thick of dough, an inch thickness of dough here um, in my round, pressed right in. And I'm gonna do the same thing with my other piece. Cover it up nice and tight and really press down on it to force it in the edge of that plastic so it's filling in those little cracks. That's gonna make it a little easier when we go to roll it out later that it doesn't instantly start cracking on us. And now that we have our dough made, we wanna let it rest in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes. And that's gonna do three things for us. One, our butter started out nice and cold, but as we've worked with it, both with kneading and cutting it in, it's starting to get softer. And we wanna make sure that we have that visible butter throughout so it stays nice and flaky for us. Um, so we wanna make sure that butter has a chance to chill. So that's what we're going to do um, as, we're, as we're letting it chill for those 30 minutes. So the other two things that are going to happen, um, we talked a little bit about gluten and how it has this kind of elasticity. So as we've worked our dough right now, if we would try and roll it out, it would kind of become the amazing shrinking dough. Um, and when you're trying to, to fight with your dough like that, you'll roll harder and it stretches back more or kind of shrinks back more. So you need to let it rest. Um, and that's what's happening during this process too. So our butter is chilling, our gluten has a chance to relax. Um, and the last thing that's happening is that flour takes time to absorb moisture. And so as it's sitting there in the refrigerator, the flour has a chance to kind of get all of that excess moisture that was in there so that when we take it out later on, it shouldn't feel dry or too tacky on the outside. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these in the refrigerator. And I'm going to put them in an even layer so that they're chilling nicely for us. You can also freeze the dough at this point. So you can keep it in the refrigerator for a day or two if you're not going to use it. You can go ahead and freeze it. You can freeze it up to three months and then just take it out of the freezer and put it in the refrigerator to thaw overnight and use it right from the refrigerator. I'm going to do a quick cleanup on my bench here and then we'll start talking about our filling. So with our apple filling today, we are gonna be peeling and slicing our apples. And I'm just gonna quickly show you how we like to peel and slice our apples here at the baking school. We had kind of an apple peel off between instructors a few years ago, and this was the winning method. Um, so with my peeler, I'm going to make a circle on the bottom and then also on the top. And then I'm gonna connect those two. So just going from top to bottom, I'm gonna peel this. And then once we get it peeled, I'm going to set it up straight on my cutting board. And with my paring knife, I'm gonna hold on and cut down on all four sides of the core. And what that does is give us kind of nice half moon pieces that are flat on one edge. 
So we can line them up and then cut them nicely. So we're gonna cut these in quarter inch slices. And we're doing that because we're gonna be pre-cooking this filling. So if you've ever made mile high apple pie and you have kind of a bountiful amount of apples in there um, and then you cook your pie and when you cut into it, there's a big gap between your crust and your apples. Um, that's from the apples cooking down in the oven um, and kind of releasing all of their juices. And so in this particular pie, because we have kind of a cream base that we're gonna be using for it, we wanna make sure that our apples are giving off most of their moisture by cooking them beforehand. So I've already cut up the rest of my apples here. Now, if I was making a traditional apple pie where we were just putting it in a crust and then baking it, I tend to like to use a variety of apples. So I like to think of flavor. Is it sweet or is it tart? I like to think of texture. Is it firm or is it softer? Um, and using a combination so that you get all of those different textures and flavors in my pie. Now, because we're gonna be cooking these ahead of time, I really like to use a firmer apple. So, um, Honeycrisp, Braeburn, Gala, all good options here. Um, Granny Smith would be really great also because you have that nice kind of tart flavor with it. But we wanna make sure that we're cutting them a little thicker than you normally would for your pies um, so that they hold shape even after we cook them. So I'm gonna go ahead and move my cutting board out of my way here. So I have my apples all cut and peeled, and we are going to add some sugar to these. So our sugar gets divided in this recipe. Some is going to go in with our apples right now, and we're gonna to toss them together. And as we're coating the apples with the sugar, sugar pulls moisture from things. And so we're gonna kind of start to macerate our apples here. They're still, they'll start to give off their juices. And we are gonna put this on the stove over medium low heat with a lid on for about 10 minutes. As it starts to cook, the apples will warm up and they'll start to release their juices. After that 10 minutes on medium low heat, we're gonna remove the lid and then continue baking, or excuse me, continue cooking it um, another 20 to 25 minutes, stirring frequently so that most of the juices have reduced down. So at that point, your apples will be nice and tender um, and the juice has become kind of syrupy instead of really, really juicy. So once that happens, your apples will look like this. So you can see that they are um, kind of nice and softened and there's a little bit of the kind of thickened apple juice there down at the bottom. We wanna make sure that our apple mixture is completely cool before we start putting our other ingredients into it. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that off to the side and we'll talk about getting our other filling ingredients together. I'm gonna grab a bowl here. And you could just dump all of the filling ingredients in there. Usually when I'm making a pie, when we talk about the starches that we have in there, um, I usually like to mix the sugar and the starch together so that the starch doesn't clump initially when we start to mix it together in kind of a, a moister filling. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of sugar, that sugar that was left over from dividing some with our apples there. And we're using granulated sugar today. You could use brown sugar, either light or dark. Um, and depending on the sweetness of your apples, you could increase or decrease the sugar depending on your tastes. The next thing I'm going to add is a little bit of flour. So flour is going to be our thickener here. When I think of thickening my apple pies, I usually like to use thickeners that are already in my pantry. So we have flour to make our crust. Why not use flour as our thickener here? Um, apples also have a lot of pectin in them, which is a natural thickener. And so we don't need a lot of thickening power for this particular pie. Um, if you have a particular thickener that you like using, please check out our, our website at kingarthurbaking.com and you can see our pie thickener chart on our website and it breaks down all the different thickeners that you can use if your pie is um, made with fresh fruit or frozen fruit and it kind of lets you know um, what amount of each to use depending on the pie that you're making. Um, so again we're going to use flour today. I'm going to add a little bit of salt. So even though we have a sweet filling we want to make sure that it has good flavor in there. 
I'm also gonna add a little bit of cinnamon, some ground cinnamon. And then when we talked about our ginger kind of spicing things up, we're gonna add some candied ginger, some crystallized ginger. And I'm gonna to toss all of these dry ingredients together. And that way, the flour is being broken up by the sugar and the ginger pieces in there, and we won't have to worry about lumps forming in our kind of starchy lumps in our filling. All right, I'll set that to the side where we work on our wet ingredients. So I have some sour cream, we have full fat sour cream, and to that I'm going to add a little bit of vanilla and an egg. And I'm gonna crack my egg into a separate bowl here just in case a shell gets in. It's much easier to find it in this bowl than it would be in my sour cream. I'm gonna add those together and then just whisk that egg into the sour cream mixture. We're gonna be mixing it in all together with our apples, so it doesn't have to be completely worked in, but I like to make sure that the, the egg yolk is combined. Okay, we are ready to add all of this together. So I'm gonna take my apples, and we're gonna add our dry ingredients in. And our sour cream mixture. And we're gonna to toss this together so that all of the apples get coated in that sugar and sour cream mixture. So just fold that together, make sure all of the sugar gets mixed in, don't have any dry patches in there. just do a quick wipe down on my surface here because we're gonna start rolling next. So I wanna make sure that my surface is nice and dry and clean. I made some dough ahead of time, so it's been in the refrigerator for at least a good hour now. So the minimum amount of time you wanna wait for your dough is about 30 minutes, but it can definitely be longer. It can be a couple hours or even the next day or two. Um, as I look at my dough now, and we talk about kind of the temperature of it. If you just made your dough 30 minutes ago and you feel it, you'll probably see that it, you can easily leave an indentation with your finger. Because I've made my dough ahead of time and it's a little firmer now, that butter is nice and cold, it's hard for me to make an indentation with my finger. And when our dough is really cold like this, it can lead to cracking where we end up with kind of a Pac-Man dough. Um, so before we start rolling, I'm going to put a little bit of flour down, both underneath and on top of my dough. And we'll take a few seconds to talk about rolling pins. Lots of different rolling pin choices out there. Most of you are probably familiar with the ball bearing pin, so it has the handles with the nice heavy barrel that you just gently push on them and it kind of takes care of all of the heavy work. This is a French style pin. This particular one is tapered, but there are also some that are just straight across. And the biggest difference between these two is that when we're using the ball bearing pin, we have our hands off to the sides on the handle. When we're using the French style pin like this, instead of our hands being out to the side, we wanna be right over the dough so we get pressure right where we need it. Um, so I'm going to use both of them as I go through rolling out today. I'm going to start with the ball bearing pin. And again, my dough still seems a little on the cool side. So I'm going to kind of tap down on my dough with my rolling pin and then give my dough about an eighth of a turn. And what that's going to do is make that cold butter a little more pliable. So if you think of it as... Um, modeling clay, kind of that modeling clay consistency, we want it to move easily with us. 
also turning an eighth of a turn each time allows it to stay round instead of squaring off if we would turn it a quarter turn. So as I feel this now, I can feel that it's gonna move with me a little easier now, and I can start rolling. So I'm gonna start by starting in the center, and I'm gonna push down and roll away from me. I'm gonna roll up to the edge, but not over. And then I'm gonna do the same thing from the center back. And I'm gonna give it a quarter turn. So pushing out and then pulling back. And I like to turn my dough as I go because I feel like I have the most pressure directly in front of me. So I'm not turning my rolling pin or my body as I'm going around, I'm turning the dough. The other thing that it ensures is that as I'm rolling, it's not completely stuck to the counter when I get done rolling. The other option, if it's a little bit easier instead of turning it so much, is to roll like the rays of the sun. So I'm rolling from the center, the rays of the sun kind of around the top, and then same thing around the bottom. And that can help keep your nice round shape. So as we're rolling, you may find areas that are kind of thicker. The dough is a little bit thicker here. And what happens when we roll over the edge instead of just up to it is that we start to create this peninsula. Um, and we don't want to have that. So we want to think of kind of making an imaginary line here so that we're rolling up to that edge, but not over. And that will help this dough then align with the rest of the kind of the round edges. You can see some small cracking here, but again, because this is a generous amount of dough, we're gonna be trimming most of that off. So I don't worry about those little cracks around the edges. If we started to get that Pac-Man-like crack, you would use the same process of rolling up to the crack, but not over, and that would keep it from getting larger. So I'm gonna make kind of a imaginary line there and not roll past there. And you can see the little kind of marbleization of butter in my crust. If it starts to stick to your rolling pin a little bit, we can just add a little more flour. And we're wanting to roll this to about an eighth of an inch which will be about the thickness of a cracker. If you ever find that it's sticking underneath, you can take a bench knife or a spatula and just kind of help it up and then add just a little more flour as needed to make sure it's not gonna stick for you. So it's about an eighth of an inch thick and we want it to be about two to three inches larger than the diameter of our pie pan. So I'm gonna grab my pie plate here. And when we take a look at it, I'm pretty good on this side. I'd like to have maybe just a little bit more on these edges. And this is where we can kind of use just one part of our rolling pin. So instead of rolling over all of this, I'm going to kind of pivot up on just one edge of my rolling pin and kind of work those areas out. Again, the rays of the sun, and same on this side. So I'm working just those areas that need to be pushed out instead of going over the whole dough. As I check again, that looks good. I have about two to three inches all the way around. As we go to transfer our dough into our pie plate, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. My favorite way is to just fold it in half brush off any excess flour that you have there, and then in quarters, and that makes it much easier to pick up. You can bring your pie plate closer and then set that right in the center, so the tip of my, center tip of my dough is right in the center, and then I'm just gonna unfold the pastry into my pie pan. Now, if you remember when we talked about gluten, kind of that elastic structure that it has, we want to make sure that we're not just pressing the dough down into the pan, which would stretch it, and then it would want to shrink back. We're actually going to lift up on the edge of the crust and help the pastry into the bottom and sides of this pie pan. So we don't want it to stretch. We want it to be kind of nice and relaxed in there, helping it all the way to the bottom. <laughs> 
And some people like to trim at this point. You can see I have kind of some excess along the side. I like to wait until I get my lattice work done and then I trim it all at once and then do my crimping. So I'm gonna leave mine just like this. I'm gonna move it just a little bit off to the side here so that we can roll out our second piece of dough. And we'll do that in the exact same way that I'm gonna sprinkle my surface with flour. I'm gonna unwrap my dough. We'll kind of assess, does it feel like it's gonna move with me or is it a little bit firm? Still feels a little bit firm. So I'm gonna tap down on it a little bit with my French style pin. So same thing, just little taps over the dough, giving it an eighth of a turn. If it feels like it's sticking, kind of make sure to get the flour around there. And when it starts to feel like it will give to easy pressure, like it is now, we can start rolling. So I'm gonna start in the center with the French pin. My hands are right over the dough. I'm pushing out and then pulling back and then giving it a turn. Pushing out, you'll notice as I get further on here, I'm actually going up my forearm. That makes it a lot easier than using my wrists for all of that pressure. So you can use your, your forearm as your pie pastry gets larger. And we're gonna roll this out same way to about an eighth of an inch thick. Should be about two to three inches larger than our pie pan. So putting pressure right where I need it. As I'm rolling here. That looks good, let's do one little check here. So yep, yeah, that looks like it's just about right for us. So because we're gonna be making a lattice with this, I'm going to score the size, kind of the width of my strips before I actually cut them. I'm gonna grab my ruler here. And depending on how, um, kind of how much detail work you'd like to do, you can decide if you want your lattice pieces smaller or larger. So I'm going to be cutting mine in half inch wide strips. So I'm gonna be doing kind of more lattice work. You can always cut your strips wider, like an inch or an inch and a half, and you'll just do a little less lattice work. So you can decide what works best for you but I'm just gonna score where I'm gonna be cutting first so that they're all even. And then I'll go back through and cut them. So it's nice to use a, a pastry cutter for this. You can also use your bench knife or a paring knife to do this. And if it starts to stick, you can just roll your cutter in a little bit of flour every few cuts and that should help a little bit. I'm gonna separate them and kind of move them to the side as I cut them just to give us a little more space when I actually go to start assembling our pie. And I like to keep them in kind of the same order as I start cutting them so that the smaller strips are there for the edges, which I'll use first, and then the larger strips are in the center as we work towards the center of our pie. And again, depending on how much lattice work you wanna do, you can make these smaller or larger. Go all the way across our dough. If as you're working with your dough, if it feels like it's starting to get a little warm, um, there's a couple different things you can do. If it's not sticking to your bench, kind of like mine is where it's moving freely, you can just go ahead and transfer your strips onto a baking sheet. 
that's lined with parchment paper or dusted with a little flour and you can put your strips in the refrigerator so that they firm up a little bit. If you find that your dough is kind of so sticky and warm that it's stuck to your countertop, um, I found that you can freeze a baking sheet and then take it out of the freezer and place it on your dough and sometimes that's enough to chill it enough, chill the butter, whatever fat you're using in there um, to be able to get it off your countertop a little easier. just about done. If you have scrap pieces left over as you're cutting, I always like to just pile them up by layering them on top of each other. So instead of balling them up into the dough again, um, I'll just kind of stack them and that will help keep the layering so that when we re-roll and use it um, for something else, if we were cutting out shapes or um, just making kind of the little cinnamon sugar rolls that you can with leftover dough, it's nice to keep it nice and flaky instead of mixing it all together. Just about done here. And then we'll be able to get our filling in our pie. Now I have my strips here, and I'm gonna bring my pie a little bit closer so that we can get our filling in there. I'm gonna give the filling one more stir before I put it in. We'll get it right into our pie plate here. Just gonna even everything out in there so it's nice and flat, bringing it right to the edge of my pie plate. Okay, now we can focus on our lattice work. So the first thing that we're gonna do, move these over just a little bit more, is lay strips vertically right over our pie. So I'm gonna start kind of at this smaller end on one end, and I'm gonna start laying my strips. Maybe about a half inch to an inch apart. And then once we get them all going, Vertically, we're going to start thinking about our horizontal pieces. Take some of the shorter ones on the edge here. Let's do one more. Okay, so I have my pieces there. So now I have all of my vertical strips done. And as we start to add our horizontal ones, we're going to think of all of our odd, odd and even numbered strips. So I'm going to start with my odd numbers, so I'm gonna pull back, oops, pull back number one, and number three, and number five, and number seven, and number nine, and I'm gonna add in my horizontal strip here. The ones on the edges, I'm just gonna kind of help up just a little bit. And then I'm going to replace all of those. So I'm going to replace one, three, five, seven, and nine. And now we're going to move on to our even numbers. So I'm going to pull back number two, four, six, and eight and then place another horizontal piece in there, and then replace those. And we will continue to do our lattice that way first 
with the odds and then the evens and then going back. So I just finished up with my evens, so I'm gonna pull back my odds again. Get our horizontal piece in there. And then replace all of them. Then I'll go back to my evens. And we'll just keep repeating that pattern. Once we get all of this done, we'll do one more here, I think. We will trim our excess pastry away. And then we'll talk about crimping, getting a nice edge to our pie. So again, with those extra pieces, I usually like to just kind of fold them up and over themselves. And you can even fold them kind of one more time over themselves. Um, and you can just set that to the side and we'll add our other trimmings to that in just a moment. Now, as we go along the edge of our pie, we wanna have about an inch overhang on the side to make that edge crust for us. Um, if you're someone that prefers kind of just the crust cut off at the edge, you can just go around your pie plate and cut it off evenly with that. I always like the crust as my favorite part, so I like to have that little thicker edge. Um, so I'm gonna go around my pie and kind of trim where I'm about one inch away. And to figure that out, I use my kind of the first digit of my finger here up against my pie plate. And then as I go around, I'm just gonna make a little cut where that first digit is so that I can connect all of those together and I have about an inch all the way around. Just makes it a little easier than trying to stay in one spot and figure out how much you're cutting off. So I'm gonna do that all the way around. And then we'll connect those together. So you could use a paring knife to do this. I like to do it with scissors. We're just trimming off that excess pastry. With this generous amount of dough, usually what I end up trimming off is enough to make another single pie crust, or you can use it again to make the little cinnamon sugar twists or little turnovers would be nice too. You can freeze it for next time, or you can roll it out and even make little leaf shapes or kind of special shapes to go on top of your pie. pieces out of the way. Okay, so now that I have trimmed my pie, oops, had an extra one there. Um, I'm going to take that outer crust with the lattice work and I'm just gonna tuck it under so that it's sitting on the edge of my pie plate. So it's really just kind of tucking it under. I'm not pinching or kind of getting the dough to stick together at this point. I'm really just tucking it under to make that nice lip that we'll be able to crimp. So making sure that the lattice part gets tucked under also. And then once we go all the way around, I'm going to kind of pinch those two layers of dough together so that they adhere to each other. And then we can do our decorative crimping. 
And it's important that our crust is kind of sitting on the edge of our pie plate here. When we put it in the oven, we don't want the butter to melt too fast and then just kind of slump over the edges. So it's really good to have your crust kind of supported on the edge of your, on the edge of your pie plate. I'm gonna grab just a little bit of flour from my fingers here. And when we start the crimping process, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, I like to choose kind of pushing out the crust with my first finger and then pinching it on the outside here. So I'm kind of pressing and then pinching around that. And I'm gonna do that all the way around. If it starts to get a little sticky, you can always just add a little more flour to your fingers. If you find that your crust is getting really soft at this point, you can always put it back in the refrigerator, particularly before you bake it. If we think of soft butter going into a hot oven, um, it will melt and kind of droop over the edge before the proteins in the flour can set to hold everything together. If we have cold butter, kind of if we would refrigerate our crust and have cold butter going into a hot oven, um, the crust will hold shape a little bit better because the proteins will have a chance to set before that butter actually melts. A little sticky there. Almost all the way around here. And there we have our pie, and it looks beautiful like this. Um, and there's one more little thing that we can do just to spruce it up a little bit for the holidays. Um, totally optional. We have that sugar in our crust and we have the butter in there, and both of those things will brown and start to caramelize as this is baking. Um, but to give it kind of a, a nice shine and a little more golden brownness on the top, I am going to brush it with a little bit of milk or cream. And for me, the more important part of this is that it's going to act as the glue for my sparkling sugar, coarse sugar that I'm going to sprinkle over the top. And the sparkling sugar stays clear and won't bake into the crust. So it'll be a nice little kind of crunchy layer on our lattice work. And I always like that little bit of sweetness with my pie but totally optional. You don't have to do it. Um, even with the brushing with milk, you don't have to do it. This just helps to give it a really nice golden brown finish. Okay. I'm gonna sprinkle it with a little bit of that coarse sparkling sugar. and our pie is ready to go in the oven. Now let's talk a little bit about kind of pie pans and how I like to bake my pies. So whenever I'm baking a fruit pie, I always like to make sure that I'm baking it on a parchment lined or foil lined baking sheet so that if any of the juices go over the edge, it's much easier to clean up this way than to actually have them going into your oven. Um, Lots of different pie pans that you have out there. Uh, when I think of them, metal is kind of the best conductor of heat. So um, things tend to brown really well in metal pie pans. You can see I have kind of this beautiful stoneware pan, um, which is great once it gets hot, but it takes a really long time for it to get hot. So it's important um, as we're baking this that we either bake in the very bottom of our oven, or if you have a pizza stone that you can preheat in your oven as well, that's really great for getting intense heat from the bottom to make sure that our bottom bakes through. Um, if you have a glass pan, it's nice because you can actually peek underneath and see if it's, if it's browning well for you. This pie is going to break in a preheated 425 degree oven uh, for about 15 minutes and then we will put it in a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes. And what we'll see after that um, is that it gets really nice and golden brown. The filling should be actively bubbling in the center. So when we're looking at the 
um, the filling and kind of the starches that are in there. Most starches activate when the filling has actually come to a full boil, and so making sure that it's bubbling in the center will ensure that your filling will set and that it's hot enough that the bottom is baked through for you. So let's look at our finished pie again. So again, we have that really nice golden brown crust. We can see where the filling was kind of bubbling through the edges here. Um, even the lattice is nice and golden brown. So this looks beautiful. We hope this class has inspired you to share the joy of baking this season and beyond. You'll find the ginger to apple cream pie recipe on our website at kingarthurbaking.com. If you have any questions along the way, be sure to reach out to our expert team of bakers on our Bakers Hotline. Send them an email, chat with them live, or give them a call at 1-855-371-2253. Until we can bake with you again in person at our Vermont or Washington State locations, our baking school is offering interactive online classes for beginners to advanced bakers. We look forward to joining you in your kitchen to make everything from biscuits and scones to baguettes. From all of the employee owners here at King Arthur Baking Company, happy baking.